a faithful one, righteous and true. I am the grateful one, dumbfounded by you. You are the mighty one, able to save. I am the broken one, in need of your grace. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administration, variety of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Right around verse 12 of chapter 12, we began looking at what I call the analogy of giftedness. In verses 1 through 11, we looked at the theology of giftedness. That it was not, it was not just something we thought up, it was something God created. It's a theological issue. It is something that happens miraculous, miraculously at our conversion. And conversion is miraculous. Amen. Jesus Christ intervened in my life. He met me on the Damascus road, so to speak. And he came into my life and he challenged me with my sin. He convicted me of my condemnation and he convinced me that without him and without him alone, I could have no hope of heaven. So I came to Christ. And many of you sitting here have done the same thing. Then we began looking at four key aspects to understanding this unity amongst diversity. We're all different. And there's a diverse giftedness within this group, but we're one what? Body. Well, Paul uses the analogy of the body. There's, there's great diversity in the body, is there not? But it's yet one body. The one, this one body I exist in has many members, many parts, yet it operates as one. <clears throat> so the first thing we saw in this was that Paul looked at the natural body as an illustration. He looked at our placement in the body. Not all of us are a finger. Not all of us are a toe. He says, where would the body, if the whole body were an eye? If it were an eye, where would the smelling be? If it were just the head, where would, and not the feet? Can the feet say, because I'm not of the head, I'm not of the... No, it's of the body. You're part of the body. You're needed. And, he, and the purpose was he was trying to show everybody that we all have a place and have a purpose and have a need within the body. He clearly wants us to understand our place. He clearly wants to understand our purpose for being in the body. Our placement, our place, and our purpose for being in the body. Amen? And, and listen, we have to accept that in, in contentment. And we're going to look at that a little bit deeper this morning. We must learn that we have been placed here by divine design. Now we understand that there's what we call the universal body and there's the local body. And the universal body has many parts as much as the local. The local really is a miniature universal. That's what we are. That's how you want to see it. We're a miniature universal church. And, and, and just as a universal church has every gift it needs to do the work worldwide, the local church has every gift it needs to do the work locally. Listen, selfishness will never be satisfied or content. If you live in the realm of selfishness and you say, how come I can't be? Or how come I can't have? You will never have what you think you'd be content with. Selfishness is never satisfied. 
Amen? If you live a selfish lifestyle, you will be the most unhappy, discontented, and dissatisfied individual in the face of God's green earth. Would you all say amen? Isn't that true? The minute you become selfless, you become happy, especially as a Christian. Amen? It's about others, not about me. We looked at the uh, aspect of our personal dependence on the entire body. We need even the members who aren't the forefront, who aren't out, you know, like the, remember I talked about the eye and the iris and all of that, and, and we don't say how, you know, how many parts the eye has. We don't say what a beautiful iris you have. We, have, we say what beautiful blue eyes you have. And, and, and that's, that's all, you know, beautiful eyelashes and all that, but there's all kinds of parts in there to make those things work. And what God did is he gave them more importance in, to the eye. This thing's, the color of the eye isn't the most important part of the eye, is it? And the color knows that. The color understands I need all those other things back there so I can shine. And what God did is he made it that way so there would be no I'm better than you. Because that's not true. Amen. We need everybody, even Skylar. Your grandfather better lock you in a room, I'll tell you that right now. So let's look at the final aspect of the church or of understanding this unity. We looked at the first three, let's look at the first Four, let's look at the, the first three, let's look at the, the fourth. I'm really lost today, aren't I? The fourth, the final aspect. You know, the church of Corinth had some issues. They did. We've been studying them for quite a while. I, I got thinking about them just a little bit by way of introduction because we're coming to a conclusion here where Paul is saying, listen, here's your problem. You guys are running around desiring what you call the better gifts. And you're filled with schisms. You're filled with division. You're filled with disunity. You're filled with discontentment. You're filled with unhappiness because you're not just doing it right. I wrote this down. They, they were fractured by factions. They were. Go back all the way back to chapter 1. He says, I understand there are divisions among you. There was a group over here and a group over there, here a group, there a group, everywhere a group, group. And listen, they just all kind of thought they were better than everybody else. You know what you need to do, believers, at grace? Get over yourself. Because we're all sinners. Amen? Saved by? Deserving of? Absolutely nothing but eternal hell. And the grace of God came into our life and saved us and brought us into the body. And guess what? As much as I hate to admit it, I need Eric Brown. I just haven't figured out for a while yet. As much as I admit it, I need Randy. As much as I want to admit I need Ron, and Ron needs me. Woo. Right? There's no room for factions here. We need, listen. I can't tell my body I don't need certain parts of it, because I do. Even the ones I don't see, the ones that are so lovely, I need them in order to function. So they were fractured by factions. They were also frustrated by feuding within. They, 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 there was contentions. There was lawsuits on and on and on and on. It was just a frustrated church because everybody was trying to get ahead and get even. You heard that old saying, I don't get mad, I get what? I don't think we should get even. Leave it to God. They were floundering in functionality. And that's where we are now in chapters 12, 13, and 14. They were gifted, but they were misusing them, mishandling them, misunderstanding them, and they were using them for their own benefits not for the body. And so they were failing in their faithful testimony because of all of this. It's implied throughout the book. 
They had responsibility in the city of Corinth to be a shining light to an ungodly world. Is that not our responsibility here? To be a shining light? I mean, listen, we're not doing this Memorial Day thing or, or trunk or treat or whatever we do because we need something to do because we all have plenty we need to do, we could be doing. Plenty that day we could be doing. We do it because there are people sitting on those streets that need to see that we know who Jesus Christ is and they need to know who he is too. That's why we do what we do. Paul now wants to bring the whole analogy to a personal application individually and collectively. He says, now, he says, see a little verse in verse, a little word in verse 27. Now, he says, now the end of this whole argument, the purpose of this whole analogy is for you to understand in a practical way that your giftedness has a purpose, has a place, has a design, and you must live within it. And no one can say, well, I'm just a foot. I'm not needed. So I'm not going to do anything. Because you know what you do? You ever sat in a certain position and had, you had your foot go to sleep? I mean, really bad to sleep. And you get up and try to walk? <clears throat> right? If that foot chooses not to work right, it puts more stress on the... And you hear it, it puts more stress on the rest of the... Body. Say it again, it puts more stress on the rest of the... Body. Listen, when I choose not to function in my giftedness for this body, it puts more stress on the body. So I have a responsibility to search and understand and prayerfully work through my understanding of my giftedness and use it for you and you vice versa for me. Isn't that a beautiful thing? So let's look at the last aspect. And I call this the aspect of really a powerful application to it all. First of all, verse 27 this is, uh, verse 27, I said, listen, we all have a part. Now you are the body of who? We're not talking about physical body, we're talking about the spiritual body, right? You are the body of Christ and members individually. That word now is a word to indicate change, a change in thought. He's, he's moving from the analogy to the practical. He's moving from the analogy to the reality. He said, listen, folks, I've kind of applied it all. Now I want you to know who you are in relation to this place called Corinth. And I want you to know who you are in relation to this place called... Because if you think you're here by accident, dream on. If you didn't think there's some divine design for this church, just like there was a divine design for that steeple to fall on the ground, thankfully I wasn't under it. But if I was, that would have been by divine design too. I have no idea why, but I would have said, thank you, Lord, but uh, tell me why later. <laughs> right? God intervened. God allowed it to fall down. Why? Maybe it's time to get a new one, probably. Thankfully, it blew down while no one was on the roof. Whatever would have happened while I was up there putting the roof on a year ago. No good stiff wind come by. So God knows what he's doing. And listen. God didn't bring you here by action. God didn't bring you to himself by... He, he designed it from the beginning of the foundation of the world. Now, the word individually is a key word for this first aspect of this subject. The word individually is a kind of a multifaceted word. It means a portion from the whole of some natural object, like... You are part of the body. So you say the hand, you're a portion of the what? Body. The other hand, you're a portion of the whole body. The eye, you're a portion of the body. You're part of the body. In, in, in this Greek setup, Paul was referring to here our relationship to the body of Christ. Universally, Grace Bible Church is a part of the ultimate body of 
Christ and is part of the body of Christ's mission to reach the world. And this is the part of the world. This part of that universal body is what reaching. I could say the same thing about Word of Life. I could say the same thing about every other Bible college. They're part of the ultimate universal body of Christ in their area reaching the world for Christ. Locally, we're part of the body of Christ to reach this area. But it really is also speaking of if you are part of it, right? You should be participating in it. So whenever you hear something that's going on, you shouldn't be asking yourself, how can how how can I avoid it or get out of it? You should be asking yourself, how should I be involved in it? whether it be through prayer or giving or working or doing, whether it be this thing we're doing for Memorial Day or Trunk or Treat or DVBS or clubs or choir or whatever, or work day, right? If I wake up tomorrow morning, my body has to go to work and half the body is asleep and non-functional, I'm going to have a hard time working on it. I'll get it done, but I have to work hard to get it done. Amen? And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. He said, man, if you are part, personally part of the universal body as a ch- collective church and, and part of a local body a, as a church member or church attender, then you need to be participating. Right? Did y'all say amen? amen. Or ouch? I, I, either one works, but it's true. The body cannot function in parts. It must function as a whole. Isn't that true, Amy? Take the heart out of my body, sit over on the corner, and say function. It's going to say, I'm dead. But then guess what the heart's going to say? So are you. Right? Has to be intact and functioning for the whole. The body's useless in parts. Just ask someone who blew up or whatever. You know, the body's useless in parts. It can't function in parts. It must be part of the whole. I remember speaking of blowing up, my father was a pipe fitter, right? And I was a young dummy. Now I'm just an older one. But uh, he had these things, and I don't know what they were called, but the purpose was was they they had a a valve, an air valve on the end, and you would put them in a pipe, and you could blow them up to plug up the what? The pipe. And so there'd be no water flow while you might be working on the other end of the pipe before you connect it or whatever. I, they had a purpose anyway. I had no idea. So I started to blow that baby up. I'm saying how big I can get it. I had it in my hand. Blowing up, bounce a little bit, blowing up. Guess what happened? When you blow things up too much, it what? It blows up. Laid my hand right open. <laughs> you think I really want to go and tell my father I did that? <laughs> Couldn't hide it. You're right. See, that part of the body cannot function unless it's part of the body. It could not heal unless the rest of the body was connected to it. It could not become usable again unless the other body ministered to it to help it get healthy again. That's what happens when people get limbs severed and they try to reconnect them and it doesn't really get reconnected right. What happens to that limb? But miraculously in today's technology, they really can do some fantastic work and they can reconnect limbs and they become functional again. But it needs to be connected to the body. And Paul is saying here, listen, you need to be part of the body. You are part of it. Function that way. In chapter 1, verse 7, you don't have to turn to it, but Paul said this. He said, you are not lacking in any spiritual gift. And he said that early on before he got to this chapter. He said, listen, you have all the gifts. How many of you think we have all the gifts we need here, right here today? Raise your hand. 
We have every gift we need to function as a church body today, right now. We may not have all the gifts. Some of them aren't necessary. But we have everything we need. Did y'all say amen? Listen to what John MacArthur said here. And I, I, I wrote this down because it was really neat. He says, as a local church, speaking of Corinth, they were Christ's body in miniature. A representation of Jesus Christ to all of Corinth. You could say, as a local church, Grace Bible Church is Christ's body in miniature. And we are a representative of all the area surrounding us where we are locally. This is what he said. Every local church, everyone. And I said this years ago, and someone told me, no, I don't think that's true. I said, we have, we have a small, I said, we have every gift we need. He said, no, 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 we, we, we don't have them all. I said, we have every gift we need. I did not say we had them all. Right? Every local church is fully equipped to serve the Lord just as every believer is fully equipped to serve him. Listen, if you were gifted at conversion, you have everything God intended you to have for the sake of this place. But every single part of the body needs to be functioning. Because they're not. The rest of the body is stressed to drag along the dysfunctional part of the body. Not everybody's going to have the gift of teaching. Not everybody's going to have the gift of proclaiming the truth. Nobody's going to have the gift of administration. But everybody has a We have a part. Secondly, in verse 28 to 30, we have a place. You see, you see, you see in verse 28, he says he is what? And God has? That word appointed means to assign duty, responsibility, or obligation to someone. It is a personal duty to function for the body as a whole. And the list he's going to give is not exhaustive. Do you know why Paul never gave an exhaustive list? Because he never could do that. Remember what I said way, way back? God can take different mixtures of gifts and give them to the individuals because the body needs a certain mixture. I, I don't even think the Bible contains a full list of giftedness God can provide. As a matter of fact, I think it's not exhaustive for another reason. The church of Corinth had a little bit of a problem wanting the more showy gifts. Everybody wanted to be in the spotlight because that was based on self-serving selfishness. And Paul says, I'm going to give you a list that's going to kind of detract from that. I don't want you to make... And by the way, if you, if you give every, take every list Paul gave in Corinthians and Romans, this, they're different. Why? Because he said, you know what? It's not the list that you need to worry about. It's not what you have. It's what you do with what you have. Amen? He wanted them to get away from this desiring these showy gifts. He says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Those were kind of the speaking and equipping gifts. And then he said there were miracles and tongues and helps and administrations. They were more of the stabilizing, establishing gifts of the ministry. Apostles were first and prophets were second and teachers were third. That wasn't putting them in realm of importance. It was really putting them in realm of necessity. The apostles began to build the foundation of the church. The prophets were still in existence during those ages. Even Paul was called a prophet and, and Peter was called a prophet. Why? They were men who proclaimed in a local area. The word prophet over time kind of morphed into Preachers or pastors or shepherds. Go to chapter 14, verses 1 through 6, so you can see what I mean. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may what? For he who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the what? 
And he's talking about the proclamation of truth. There's no one predicting the future anymore. By the way, if you watch TV and some guy tells you what's going to happen 10 years from now and, and can say, you know, the Lord's going to return, you know, set it off. There is no predictions going on today. And, and I also kind of want to say this. There's no one dying and going to heaven and coming back and telling you about it either. Okay? It's hogwash. Okay? Doesn't happen. There's only one man that did it, and he didn't even admit that it was him. And he even said, I can't tell you what I saw because it's not lawful for me to tell you so. And that was Paul. That stuff is filled with mysticism. And it's dangerous to the gospel. It makes it like a blanket to give everybody. So you can warm up and say, I can't wait. There's only one way to get there. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, and so I, I just want you to know, I know it's a big thing out now, and it's a big bestseller book. And, and, and let me say one more thing. God doesn't need a four-year-old boy to give new revelation. It's right here. Okay? Doesn't need it. It's, it's hogwash. And I know everyone says, well, how do you know these things? Well, you know what? Parents talk and kids listen. And how do they know what they hadn't have insinuated to him that he didn't hear? And let me tell you someone else who's an angel of light. Who, knew, who knows as much as he needs to know, can put it into the head of someone so he can confuse people and draw people away from what is the absolute truth. Listen, don't fool around with this stuff. Amen? Don't. I don't say that to be critical or to throw water on your fire or excitement. I tell you that as a warning. This stuff is mysticism on steroids. But his father was a pastor. Well, so was a few other people I know. It don't mean anything. Amen? We need to be careful and understand the truth and understand that God gave us prophets and teachers and the scriptures to know and equip and understand the truth. And that's why God has gifted people to be stupid word and call them to proclaim the truth. We have a duty to, uh, to understand and acknowledge our place. And we have a duty to accept our place. Look what he says in verse 29. Are all apostles? Let me ask you a question. You answer these questions I ask you out loud. Are all apostles? Keep on going. Are uh, are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But does everybody have a place? Yes. And is every gift needed? Well, with the exception of a couple in there. We'll get to that in chapter 14. Everyone's needed. Here's the verse I really want you to see, verse 31. It's a play on words. I never saw that before until recently. He's actually telling you not to desire, not to desire. What was the people at Corinth's problem? They were desiring the what? Showy gifts, the preaching gifts, the tongue gifts, the miracle gifts, the gifts that said, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. And they were jealous if they didn't want. Have it. He says in verse 31, he says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. Stop right there. The word earnestly desire is a negative term. It, it, it has a negative connotation. It means to be jealous to become marked by an act of interest. In other words, you just always desire to be a preacher. You always desire to have tongues. You're just striving to get that tongues gift. And they are being commanded not to do that. It, should, it could read this. He, says, he could say either this. 
He should say, why do you or stop desiring the so-called better gifts? Stop being these kind of people. Just stop being a group of people who says, hey, I'm a foot. Hey, I'm an eye. I'm an iris. I'm a muscle that makes the eye twitch. I don't know what they call them, so I'll just call it a muscle. Well, I'm a liver. I'm a thyroid. I'm a white blood cell. I'm a red blood cell. I'm whatever it is. Good night. I'm getting out of my realm now. Paul says, just stop desiring to be the blue eye. Stop desiring to be the mouthpiece. Except being the articulator. The voice box, the lung that gives the voice the air it needs to function. Except that. He says, stop being so selfish. And then you will start having more unity. But then he says this. Look at the last part of verse 13. But I'm going to show you a more excellent way. And that word more excellent way really means greater in degree. My friends, God does not intend us for us to all have the same gift. But that we all have a necessary gift. And he wants us to understand that we have a necessary gift and wants us to faithfully use it for the sake of the body. I know what God has gifted me to do, and I know I need to do it for you. But I'm a part of this body too, and I want you to all find your gift and do it for the rest of the body because it helps me. Right? I think that is so beautiful. There's nothing richer than that. But then Paul says this. He says, you guys are doing it in a selfish, unloving way. And he says in verse chapter 13, you can have the most beautiful outward showing gifts, but if you don't have one thing, you have nothing. If I was to give chapter 13 a title, I'd call it Love Defined. And then I would say it's Love Described. And then I would say it's love deployed. And that may be the outline anyway. Chapter 13 will show us the only way. Not the better way. The only way that our giftedness used properly can accomplish God's glory through unity. Any other way but chapter 13, it cannot happen. And you can visit church after church after church that's not following that properly. And they've got chaos, they've got confusion, and they've got jealousy, they've got envy, they've got factions, they've got fractions, they've got all those things, and they brag about having a gifted church, but they're so disunified, it's pathetic. And I'd rather have fewer gifts and greater unity because they'll all come. Amen? Well, that's chapter 12. Let's move to chapter 13. Lord willing, next week. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we are blessed with gifts, every one of us that know Christ. To be any here that do not know Christ, may they step into that realm first and see that need first. And you will honor them with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life and he will 
gift them accordingly to the need of this body. So this body, as part of the universal body, can help the universal body reach this part of the world. And that's amazing to me. Amazing. And only a sovereign, holy, all-powerful God could even dream that up. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. are the faithful one, righteous and true. I am the grateful one, dumbfounded by you. You are the mighty one, able to save. I am the broken one, in need of your grace. Savior, my shelter, my way, you're my sword, my defender, my king. You are my portion, my rock, and my fortress, provider of all that I need. Lord, I adore you, I'm humble before you, I fall at your feet so amazed. I come to praise you, to worship and thank you, to yield to your word and your way. You're all I want, all I have, all I need. You are the faithful one, righteous and true.